Hello and welcome to our webinar, How to Choose the Best Prototyping Options for Your Project, featuring our speaker, Taylor Foster, Account Executive for the Mid-Atlantic Region. Taylor has a background in mechanical engineering and business, attended the University of Kentucky, and has been working in the manufacturing industry, specializing in injection molding, consultation, and education, as well as customer experience for the past three years. This presentation is expected to last approximately 45 minutes and is being recorded. A link to the recording will be sent out within 48 hours. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Use the questions field on your screen to submit your questions. We encourage you to follow Eccentric Mold and Engineering on LinkedIn so that you can stay up to date on our latest blog topics and webinar schedules. I now turn over the webinar to Taylor. Hey everyone, uh, really appreciate you joining us today. Uh, always nice to, to speak with some like-minded people in the manufacturing field. Uh, and uh, today we're going to talk through a couple of, of discussion topics. And today's gonna be very different from a, a normal webinar with us. So if you've attended some of my other webinars or some of our other webinars in general, um, we're often you know, talking a lot about theory. Um, today, on the other hand, we're going to get into the nitty gritty. We're going to look at some case studies. We're going to look at some specific people and the challenges that they faced and, and how those problems were solved. And throughout that, we're, we're going to walk through first the pros and cons of 3D printing, injection molding, and cast urethane. Those are your, your three most common uh, methods of prototype manufacturing. So we're certainly going to cover those. Again, we're going to go through some actual customer use cases uh, and talk about the way that they leverage different prototyping combinations for project successes. And then we're going to talk through some decision criteria based on our learnings uh, for your upcoming projects or maybe one that you're working on now. Again, let's start with a, a polling question here just to get, uh, get the blood flowing for everybody. The first question here you're going to see on your screen reads, have you ever been tasked with a project that might be a fit for a few different prototyping or production processes, leaving you unsure of just how to proceed most effectively. We've got yes, we've got no, uh, no shame in, uh, in either answer here. I'm gonna give you guys a little bit to respond, maybe 30 seconds or so. Okay, awesome. Thank you uh, for giving me your input, everybody here on the call. As you can see uh, here on the screen, We've got about 89% of folks who would say yes to this question. They have run into a project where there could be a couple different fits in terms of the right prototyping or production processes to use in manufacturing, which left them unsure of how to proceed. Got another 11% of you who are, uh, who are real prototyping buffs and uh, have not run into a project like that. I would definitely say um, to you 11%, thank your lucky stars. It is very common and very tough sometimes uh, to pick between two processes or three or, or which combination of them to use. Thank you again uh, for your quick feedback here. Let's hide that and we will launch back in to the presentation. So again, first topic, let's talk through 3D printing. Um, this is a, a process that is often going to be used when you're trying to assess feasibility of your starting design, the part or, or appearance and shape uh, are going to be key. So you need to maybe do a, phys a physical representation of the CAD model to show to internal parties for approval. It's gonna be used when you need some beginning material information, just some rough properties of different plastics, the viability for your design intent to come to life. You may also use it when accuracy, surface finish, and material properties are not your primary concern, when lower volumes are needed, when you need to stay within a smaller budget, if you do have printers available in house, it's often used in that case, obviously. It's really easy to use when you've already got it there at your fingertips. And it's used for parts that are not able to be made with any other manufacturing service due to the geometry. So a few cautions on the flip side of that coin, those are all kind of positives or when you might use it. Sometimes to be cautious about using 3D printing for your prototyping is when you're going for larger part runs, not always good for that. Certain materials are not gonna be able to, to be printed. So if you have a, an end use material for your production parts that you can't find in 3D printing, that may be a limitation. Finished parts uh, are gonna often require post-processing just due uh, to the different processes used in 3D printing. You're typically gonna see layer lines or other marks on the surface of your part um, that are going to require that post-processing. Generally, you're gonna have limited build sizes. Definitely when compared to other processes out there, you're much more limited in size. 
part orientation and structure can be difficult. Again, when you're when you're building a part layer by layer in 3D printing, the way that that part is oriented and the structure of that part can be really tough uh, to hold up in terms of integrity over time. And last but not least, just because a design can be made via 3D printing does not always mean that it can be mass produced with other manufacturing methods later. So 3D printing is great, again, to get a rough model in hand, to do some kind of initial checks and balances, but understand that just because you were able to 3D print a design does not mean you can translate it to molding or CNC necessarily. There are a lot of processes um, that geometries are not possible in that would be in 3D printing, which again, we highlighted as a positive on the left side as well. It's both a blessing and a curse at times. The second thing you may use for prototyping as a process would be injection molding. So this is often used when your parts are complex. You require inserts or over molding, maybe multiple plastics on top of one another. You're gonna use it when prototyping requires dimensional ac accuracy, the specific materials that you spec'd out for end use, or if they're being used in a fully um, you know, environmental or testing scenario. They are used when you need to verify dimensional properties of a part, they're used for evaluating material behaviors, assessing your shrink, warp, splay, sink, and other aesthetics. And it will give you a direct translation to production from prototype lessons learned. So this is something that's really good. If you're tooling in prototyping and you're also tooling in production, you're gonna have some direct translation between the tool design and, and what went well and what didn't the first time around. It's also used when you need the ability to address engineering or design changes for final fit and function with the rest of the parts in the assembly, or when your cost per part just needs to be as minimal as possible. A few cautions in, in regards to injection molding, you do typically see a higher upfront cost to create those tools, those molds, versus 3D printing or urethane casting. You do typically see longer lead times on this, certainly not the case for everyone in the industry, which we'll talk about a little later. Some design restrictions here, so there are certain features, certain geometries that uh, create problems when creating tooling. There's something called a, a die lock condition uh, where we can't get the part out of the tool, for example. And last but not least, uh, design changes in steel tools, which is your production tooling, can be really difficult and costly. So it's really important to get this right in the prototype stage so that you don't run into those costly and time consuming design changes at production. The third process you may see pretty often uh, in prototyping is gonna be cast urethane. So this is a process that on a base level is very similar to injection molding, um, but it also utilizes uh, a much softer tooling. So cast urethane is often used for marketing, right? To, to show something off, make it look really good, but maybe not necessarily uh, gonna be a long-term use for it. Functional testing, I've seen people use it for different strength testings with, with drop tests, things like that. Um, obviously, you don't want to spend so much money upfront investment on a tool just to end up finding out it doesn't work in a drop test. So good kind of middle ground to find here for that sort of testing. It's used when you have lower volume runs, lower cost alternative here to, again, limited injection molding, which we just touched on. And again, strength testing, whether it's drop testing or other things of that nature that you're going to need to verify before tooling, but that your 3D prints won't withstand. A few cautions on this, um, the urethane tool is made of silicone, so it breaks down really, really quickly. The tool life for each uh, silicone mold made through ure urethane casting is going to be 50 pieces or less. I would say on average, I typically see them last about 25 pieces before you have to recreate that mold uh, and start kind of all over again, so to speak. There are some material limitations here. As the name suggests, we're casting urethane materials. So you're not able to uh, cast you know, true thermoplastics or some of those other materials you may be looking for long-term, but you can find a, a pretty similar urethane to mimic. Um, but again, material limitations here and a note to avoid abrasive plastic fillers in the materials you're using. The reason for that is again, these are really soft tools. They're made of a soft silicone material and the more wear and tear you have on the inside of those from things like abrasive uh, materials, it's just gonna wear that out even quicker than the 50 to 25 pieces we talked about. And in case you were wondering, this is uh, one that most people maybe haven't necessarily seen as often or worked with as often. The way that cast urethane works, you start with a master model. Typically that's gonna be made via 3D printing, a process called stereolithography, also known as SLA. You can also just use a physical part that they've made, uh, customers made in the past. It doesn't necessarily have to be from SLA, 
but you're gonna take that master part and you're going to encapsulate it in silicone rubber. After that rubber cures, the master is removed from the middle of that uh, silicone rubber and that cr creates the RTV mold. So after that, the cast urethane mold utilizes your traditional injection molding process of putting plastic uh, or urethane in this case into that space, letting it cool and taking it out. Now, let's get into some fun, but first I have another polling question for the audience centered very specifically around these processes that we've just gone through. So I'm gonna launch that question here for you. And the question is, which of these processes we just discussed, so between 3D printing, cast urethane, and injection molding, which of those three have you historically used in your prototyping efforts internally at your organization? And you can select as many as apply. So you don't have to just select one of these, you can certainly select two or all three as well if you would like. Awesome, thank you everyone for your votes. Let me share our results here on the screen for you. Looks like 95% of attendees today, so almost every single one of us, have used 3D printing or additive manufacturing and prototyping. This is not a shock, I think, probably to any of us. It's the most common form of prototyping you're going to see out there. 26% of attendees today have used cast urethane molding, which is, again, uh, probably the lesser known of the three, as I mentioned. So this is pretty in line with what I would expect. But 26%, about, about a fourth of us, have used cast urethane. And 58%, a little over half, um, have used injection molding in their prototyping process before. So kind of the stack raking there looks like almost everyone with 3D printing, about half of us use injection molding, and about a quarter of us use cast urethane. Appreciate that response. And I've got one more for you. So I apologize for the for the back-to-back, -back, but I think this one's important as well before we jump into specific examples. So this question reads, which of the following have you needed to do in the course of moving a product from prototyping to production? And you, again, you can select all of these that apply. So your options are, have you ever been asked to provide an initial low cost physical prototype to marketing or other internal parties for approval? The second is asking or having been asked to do stress testing, including drop testing, hot or cold cycling, UV testing, et cetera. The third option, is scale from a low volume of parts to a higher volume gradually over time. And last but not least, uh, have you ever had to make frequent changes to features within your design, either due to market changes in the industry pace or unanticipated issues that you've run into? And again, you can select as many as you'd like. Give you guys a good 30 seconds here to digest and select some options. Okay. Awesome. Again, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate the, the feedback here, and it's going to play directly into our conversation from here. So the first option was, again, provide an initial low-cost physical prototype to show folks internally. Looks like, again, the vast majority of us have been asked to do that in the course of moving from prototyping to production on different projects we've worked on. Half of us, about 56%, have been asked to do stress testing uh, on the product before moving to the next stage. 51% of people on the call, again, about half, uh, have had to scale over time from a low volume to a higher volume at a gradual kind of rate. And last but not least, uh, three-fourths of us, about 77%, have to make frequent changes to features within their designs, either because the market necessitates it or because you run into unintended or uh, unexpected changes later in the process. So again, just take a look here, guys. I mean, more than half of us, uh, more than three-fourths of us, and, and almost 100% of us have been asked to do uh, each of these four things in our day-to-day -day job. So let's dive into to what's happened for real customers uh, that I've worked with in terms of being asked to do those exact same things and how we approached it and how we were able to kind of meet those needs from a customer perspective. So my first customer use case is from the consumer goods industry. The customer came to me and really needed to get uh, a quick prototype in front of the border marketing for internal approvals. They needed to uh, after that concept approval, they needed to, to run some more testing to ensure the product could withstand a drop from height. The height was uh, about 50 feet, so they knew that their product was going to potentially or routinely be dropped from a height of about 50 feet, and they needed to make sure that the part was going to hold up to that. And last but not least, they needed production of about 50,000 parts per year once they had figured out the first two items, right? So when they came to me and this was kind of what was described, the way we started was getting that quick prototype, right? The first thing we wanted to do was prototype an SLA using a material that was the closest approximation to what they planned to use 
uh, on their in-use production molding, right? So what do we need to approximate and how can we get something that's very representative of the end product in front of your internal organization for approval? The second thing we did was created some additional prototypes after the SLA version was approved internally. We created some additional prototypes in cast urethane specifically for the drop testing. As I mentioned earlier, um, cast urethane is, is gonna be much hardier than 3D printing, um, but the upfront cost for the silicone tooling is much lower than the cost of metal tooling in traditional injection molding. So just to get their drop test and make sure that everything was gonna work out in terms of their design and their material and dropping from that height, they were able to approximate that very closely, drop those parts that they made using cast urethane and verify that at 50 feet, they did not break. They did not have any problems with that drop testing. So check there. After that, we worked together to design a tool or a mold for traditional injection molding for prototype and low volume production, right? And, and depending on your partners, you may have different partners for prototype tools or production tools. We just so happen to specialize in prototype and low to mid volume production, as well as kind of serving as a bridge between the two. So in this case, we built that customer a prototype tool uh, that then was able to also be used in a production setting long term because they didn't go above that 50,000 parts per year. Now, on the right, you can see again just a little recap of the manufacturing processes we chose in this case for this consumer goods customer and why, right? The first was 3D printing because we wanted something that was low cost, quick turn, and representative of the final product for internal approval and socialization. The second thing we did again was cast urethane for that lower cost prototype with enough strength to withstand the drop test. And then after those were complete and we had those approvals, we moved to prototype injection molding tooling, serving both again in that first prototyping uh, kind of context and then on through production for this customer since their, uh, their volumes didn't go up to a, a level necessitating a full blown steel production tool. So that's our first example. Now, let's get some variety. The second use case here is an industrial client. So definitely some different needs, some different quantities, um, and different things that needed to be kind of verified along the way. Now, much like the consumer goods customer, this customer also quickly needed to get a prototype in front of their internal parties. Obviously, that's usually a first step for all of us, and the difference is, is just whether or not we have those in internal capabilities and 3D prints uh, in-house. Second, they needed to get to an eventual production level of 10,000 parts per year. And they knew that in the future, they were going to need design changes um, very probably because they operate in a constantly changing industry. Um, this specific client um, was working in, in lighting and with the technologies that are coming out and the smart home applications that are coming to market right now, they knew that their product would be constantly changing to keep up with that change in the industry. So when they came to me with those sets of needs, right, uh, I stepped back and I said, okay, again, first and foremost, we're going to need to quickly get them a prototype. So we're going to prototype an SLA using a material that's closest to what they would use in molding. Once they got internal approvals on that, we moved to straight uh, past urethane casting to prototype tooling that was steel safe. What does steel safe mean? That means there are some areas of the tool that we leave inserted out with uh, steel so that we can make some changes later on very quickly and very easily uh, so that we're not uh, having to add cost or lead time to the project for customers. And then last, we made small design changes at very low cost and under two weeks each time, enabling the customer to iterate on that design, keeping up with the market, but without creating delays in their market launch. So again, to recap, the manu manufacturing processes that we chose and why, the first again was 3D printing, needed that quick, quick turn, low cost representation of the product. Second was straight to prototype tooling with steel safe modifications to allow for easy and inexpensive future changes. And in this case, I've noted there was no need for cast urethane. The product didn't require intensive testing like drop testing or hot cold cycling, UV testing, things like that. Therefore, there was decreased risk uh, in adding tooling costs, right? So, so we can go straight to tooling instead of UC or sorry, cast urethane in the middle there uh, with lower risk because we don't need it to stand up to all of those crazy things in the middle that we needed the last one to. So that's an industrial example. Take a look at automotive. Uh, the customer came in needing um, a couple of different things now. Again, changed as you can see from, from last time. This time around, the customer had already created a 3D printed prototype for their board and marketing approval. They had those capabilities in-house, so they were able to very quickly and easily 
get themselves a physical item to show to the board. The second step uh, on their little path was making 50 parts per year and a material uh, and process that provided more longevity than 3D printing, right? Would have been an easy fix to say, oh, we 3D printed in internally, it passed approvals, let's go ahead and print internally 50 parts uh, and move forward with that. Unfortunately, because of process and material here, they needed more longevity out of it. 3D printing, as we all know, is just not going to stand up to the elements and to repeated stresses over time. Now, here's an interesting wrinkle, and you don't see this often uh, out there in terms of projects, but this customer actually anticipated a decrease in their quantity over time. So it was going to start at 50, and instead of scaling up to thousands, this was actually likely going to scale down to maybe 25 a year over time. And the reason for that, uh, again, is very industry specific. This was a, an automobile that was being phased out. And at this point, they needed 50. But over time, it was going to be phased out lower and lower to the quantity of about 25 parts. So a uh, very different approach here, right? We didn't want to start with 3D printing. They've already done 3D printing. What we want to start with here is utilizing cast urethane to build some soft tooling with the ability to make those 25 plus parts with more consistency and longevity than 3D printing. Now. I also noted here that we saved the customer thousands of dollars instead of moving uh, to injection molding tooling. And the real key here, the reason that we didn't go towards hard tooling was that part need, right? If they had 50 parts uh, needed initially and they were gonna scale up to thousands, cast urethane could not have possibly served that need over time with having to switch out that mold every 25 to 50 parts. However, for this customer, they're only gonna need 50 parts a year and over time that's gonna go down. So it would actually be exorbitant and unnecessary to invest in hard tooling. In this case, we were able to just provide cast urethane services to the customer, built that soft tooling, made those 50 parts a year for them in the beginning, and moved down to about 25 parts per year long term. So in this case, again, manufacturing process is chosen and why. Cast urethane recreated uh, the part that they had made in 3D printing with polyurethane materials, offering better longevity and part consistency than 3D printing could. We continued cast urethane molding over a period of years at costs much lower than aluminum or steel tooling or 3D printing for that matter. So in this case, cast urethane was, was a clear choice. Um, note here as well that if production quantities had increased to about 100 a year or more, aluminum tooling would have been used instead of cast urethane. And the reason again is that cast urethane tooling is gonna last about 25 to 50 parts, meaning that if they needed 100 a year, we would be remaking that silicone tool two to four times a year at minimum. Uh, which actually over time is going to cost much more than one upfront investment in metal tooling. So that was how we helped solve that problem. And we have one more for you. So this one is for the defense or military sector. The customer had again already created their 3D printed prototype for board and marketing approval. So already had that check. The second step for them was to find a partner who could make 50 parts per year initially but increased to about 25,000 parts per year. So this is, again, the converse of our last case study. And this part was going to be subjected, they wanted us to know right from the beginning, to very intense temperature fluctuations, UV conditions, and user forces. This was going to be used for outdoor rugged environments, as you can imagine, with the defense or military sector. So what did we want to do this time? Um, different than all the rest, once again, in this case, we skip 3D printing because it's already been internally and been approved. We don't want to do urethane casting in this case uh, because of just how rugged this part needs to be. Now, if this were just a drop test or if this were just a temperature test or something of that nature, we could certainly use urethane casting here and learn something. However, for the defense or military sector, they need a part that not only can be subjected to those different things in testing, but is going to actually last the people who are using them, the end users, uh, years and years, right? Not just months or not just for a series of tests. So in this case, urethane casting was not going to hold up to the overall rigor and force uh, and long-term exposure to the elements that this part was intended for. So how did we start? We started by designing and building an aluminum tool for injection molding using the materials and processes that they wanted to use in full-scale production, right? Uh, 3D printing and cast urethane couldn't simply could not produce the product for the environmental loading it was going to experience. And their initial part run was 50 a year, which was easily transitioned by us to 25,000 a year using that same exact tool. Again, our tools are, are typically used from prototyping 
on end to low to mid volume production, this certainly qualifies. So what manufacturing process do we choose and why? In this case, no need for the extra ES at the end. Uh, prototype tooling was the only solution that could meet the customer's needs. 3D printing and cast urethane were an option from the quantity perspective, but at the end of the day, they could not provide the product um, that could hold up to the end uses they would be subjected to. So an extra note here too, just, just for fun, had the customer's long-term quantity been only 50 parts a year, they didn't scale up, or even if they scaled down, like the last example, and they went down to 25 a year, wouldn't have changed what we would have done for this customer, because again, injection molding with aluminum or steel tooling would still have been the only choice that could withstand the intense uh, you know, forces and, and environmental factors it would be subjected to. Awesome, so I've just presented uh, a whole lot right in a row, and now I'm gonna give you a chance to give me some feedback on this, okay? So I'm gonna serve another polling question here. You'll see it pop up on your screen in a second. And the question now is, if you've never used cast, cast urethane for prototype or prototype tooling, sorry, if you've never used cast urethane or prototype tooling in your prototyping efforts historically, would you consider it after the information you learned in these examples? And your options here are yes, no, I've used cast urethane and tooling in the past and will continue to do so, or I've used them both in the past, but I don't plan to continue. All right, awesome. We've closed that poll. Let me share the results with you here. And you'll see pop up on your screen our results. We've got 61% of folks who said yes, um, based on what we've just talked about and what we've learned, you would consider using cast urethane or prototype tooling uh, after this information versus having not used it before. So that's awesome. I'm really glad that I was able to share something today um, that maybe changed the way you look at the prototyping process. That was certainly what I set out to do. There's 18% of us who said no. Uh, we haven't used cast urethane or prototype tooling and we don't plan to start. That is totally okay. Uh, just like we just went through these examples, I would imagine your use cases and examples very specifically and very well fit 3D printing, and that's totally okay. Um, so appreciate your response as well. 21% of us, uh, about a fifth, say they've used cast urethane and tooling before for prototyping, and they're going to continue to do so. So um, out of everyone who responded, about 82% of people are either going to start using it now or considering it now, or they've used it or gonna keep and are going to keep using it. Um, I think notably, 0% of people said that they've used cast urethane and tooling before, but they're not going to continue. So uh, I think that, that really speaks volumes, right? Out of all of these smart minds here today on this call, not a single person has used them and had results that said, nah, I'm not going to do this again. Really speaks volumes. Awesome. So I'm going to hide that. And let's hop back in here. Again, really, really appreciate uh, your participation there. It makes it so much more fun. So let's talk about some decision criteria for your project, right? We just talked about four different use cases for four different people who uh, undoubtedly are probably not you. So when you're looking at your project, what should you be considering when you are looking into which process or processes to use? I think the first and the best step as we've just kind of laid out on those case studies is to determine the immediate, the mid-range and the long-term requirements for the product, right? If we looked at any of those in a bubble, if we just looked at the immediate needs, we'd probably pick 3D printing 100% of the time, right? But if we're looking down the road and considering mid-range and long-term needs as well, you're gonna approach that process differently. And again, like we've talked about, potentially mix in other prototyping methods as well, just to double verify and make sure you're not having to dub double back later uh, on some costly mistakes. So the different uh, factors or requirements for your product that typically play into those, the immediate, mid-range, and long-term, is going to be first and foremost your budgetary requirements, right? If you need to stay very low on the budget side of things from an upfront cost investment perspective, 3D printing and cast urethane are gonna be great. Um, long range, if you're, if you're looking to uh, minimize the total part cost for your budgetary requirements, long term, the best solution is gonna be injection molding. So again, looking at your budgetary requirements, not just in the, in the immediate terms, but also in the mid range and long term factors. Next is gonna be speed of delivery. So how quickly do you need your first prototypes? How quickly are you going to need to complete the testing that needs to happen on your product before launch? And how quickly are you gonna need some, some samples af off of your actual tooling to verify everything before moving to production? Demonstration, testing, and in-use criteria. Once again, uh, any kind of testing you're gonna need to do, 
you're going to want to factor that in to the requirements for your product and, and think about which different processes we discussed might help you run those tests and get the results that you need. Uh, expecting or unexpected even design changes. Those are, are areas you need to keep in mind. Material requirements and production volume, right? We, we touched on every single one of these in those different examples and case studies, but now it's time to apply them to your own products, right? Um, and, and I think it's really important here and worth noting the bottom bullet point. You want to make sure that you either have the capability internally or you choose a rapid manufacturing partner who's going to work closely with you and provide options that meet all of your criteria, right? We don't want someone who just meets the speed but can't meet the budget or any of the other things you need. You need to find a partner who can consistently set good expectations for you and provide those options, deliver on those expectations to meet those criteria and get you through that product development process uh, in, a, in a quick and effective manner. So after this, let me ask you another question here. And this is more just about what you've taken away from this today, the time spent with me. And again, I very much appreciate it. But the question is, what are you going to take away from this discussion that you find most helpful? The first option being um, you need to find a, a partner who can better consult and support throughout your product development cycle. The second is maybe you'd like to step back and look at your next project through a new lens that accounts for all of the different needs, immediate, mid-range, and long-term. Maybe you have limitations and strengths that each of these processes that you hadn't considered. Or maybe you hadn't considered specifically where cast urethane might have fit into the prototyping equation, but now you have a better understanding. And you can select any of these that apply. Okay, let me share these results here. So you can see about 32% of folks, uh, a third of us, feel like they may need to find some different partners uh, who can better support throughout that product development process in terms of advice and consultation. We've got half of us, 54%, that feel like they need to take a look at the immediate, mid-range, and long-term requirements for your product from the very beginning instead of starting to take those um, into consideration piece by piece along the way. 50% of us, uh, another 50%, say there are limitations and strengths for each of these processes that they hadn't considered before. I'm really happy with that. I'm always glad to, to shine some new light for folks. And last but not least, about 43% of us said they hadn't considered where cast urethane might fit in, um, but that now they may have some ideas. So that is, again, really good. That was definitely one of my goals today was to help uh, get a better understanding of where cast urethane fits into all this. So I'm gonna hide these and let me hop into our last couple of slides here. Um, just wanna talk, obviously, you know, here we are today discussing all of these different prototyping methods and, and what's the best route to go. And, you know, 32% of you said, I, I could maybe find a, a better partner out there that's a little more collaborative, a little more in tune with my needs and making sure that they meet all of them. Um, I would humbly submit us as a great resource for this sort of thing. Uh, you can see here on, on this slide our, our general capabilities, injection molded parts in as few as five business days, um, you know, rapid prototyping, whether it's 3D printing or cast urethane, uh, in as few as three or so business days. So very quick turn, uh, very low cost. We're a great partner in terms of collaboration and, and here to help you uh, every step of the way in terms of advice for your, your short, midterm, and long-term needs on projects. Um, and uh, we're, we're all here to help. At the end of the day, whether it's us or, or one of your other partners, communicate with us, use us, and talk to us about your needs and, and what you're needing to achieve internally so that we can come alongside you and help with that. One final question for you, and then we'll move into the Q&A section here today. And this one is pretty simple, um, so excuse my directness, but um, would you like the team here internally at, at Eccentric, who covers your organization, to reach out about upcoming needs or other information regarding partnership? So is there anything here today that made you say, hey, you guys may be worth talking to. I would, I would love to talk about um, some questions I have about upcoming projects or some questions I had on projects I, I did in the past. Whatever the case may be, if you'd like someone from uh, our team to reach out and talk a little bit more with you about your typical manufacturing needs and how we might be able to come alongside as a partner, um, just click yes. If not, no problem at all. I'm not offended, I promise. Um, you can just select no, it's no problem. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much again for the feedback here. It looks like a little over half of us uh, said yes, a little under half of us said no. And again, no worries either way. If you answered yes, however, um, just keep a lookout for us. We'll be reaching out here uh, in the next couple of days following the webinar here to chat with you and make sure we can answer any questions that you may be 
uh, having or experiencing at the moment. So thank you so much for, for participating again, not just in this question, but all the questions. Makes it um, so much more engaging and good to know where my audience is at as we walk through this. So thank you. Okay, would like to move into a Q&A session, which I will turn back over to uh, the lovely Mark Strobel. Thanks, Taylor. All right, so we'll go ahead and open it up to our audience for questions. Uh, please use the questions field on your screen to submit your questions. And Taylor, we already have several. Okay. Uh, the first one that came in, what are the design limitations for a cast urethane part? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. So gonna be tough to get fully in the weeds uh, right now uh, on this tail end of this call. Happy to talk more about it if you would like. But um, the quick answer is, uh, as it's very similar to injection molding, the guidelines and kind of design limitations are very similar to that of injection molding. So again, you're creating a, a soft tool instead of a hard tool and then putting urethanes instead of thermoplastics inside of there. Um, but again, this, the same design feedback for the most part is going to exist in cast urethane, um, you know, where you want to keep an eye on nominal wall thickness, you want to keep an eye on overall size, undercuts, all those sorts of things, how you're going to create the geometries. Yeah, really good question. And again, happy to talk more about it uh, offline as well. All right, so Taylor, another one. Um, have you ever run into scenarios where there isn't a best next step or the options that were discussed today or, or scenarios where an acceptable solution uh, to the problem isn't found? Yeah, wow, that's, that is a really good question. Um, I would say yes, for, for a couple of reasons. The first is that there are parts out there design-wise that can't be manufactured, right? Um, not, not trying to, to call anyone out, but certainly there are times when the design just doesn't stand up to um, feasibility. So if, if that's the case, obviously a, a pretty big non-starter, really hard to, to kind of recommend any of them if none of them will make the part. Um, another thing that we didn't discuss today was metal parts. We didn't talk about metal parts at all today. This was more focused on the plastic side. And we also didn't address CNC specifically. So obviously there are gonna be some projects that will need to go the CNC route or uh, a different route altogether based on being uh, metal as well. So you gotta, you gotta think about those guys. And then there are some in-between scenarios, right? Uh, we talked about a couple today that were really close, stuff where, where people needed 50 to 100 parts right near that cut off, cut off line between where cast urethane and molding would be best. And at that point, it really comes down to the customer's needs and, and their decision making in terms of, you know, would we rather prioritize lower upfront cost and higher long-term part cost, or would we rather have a higher upfront investment but a lower part cost over time? Right, Taylor, the next question, um, you actually mentioned it in, in uh, part of your answer to the last one, is uh, CNC machining. It was not mentioned as part of the presentation. Where does it fit in? What are some of the pros and cons? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, CNC it certainly has a lot of pros and cons as well. Um, I would say at the, the end of the day, it, it fits into this presentation uh, in that there are sometimes plastic parts you're creating via CNC machining. Um, I would say though at scale, when you start to scale up uh, producing plastic parts, the lowest cost period is gonna be injection molding. So it was really hard to bring CNC into this conversation specific to the other plastic uh, processes we discussed today just due to the fact that it simply is typically not used kind of in the same way or space. Um, at the same time, there are times where you can better prototype in CNC than something like 3D printing or cast urethane if you're using a very specific plastic um, that can be both CNC machined and molded. All right, the next, uh, actually there's two questions regarding cast urethane, I'm gonna uh, kind of mix them together. Um, when, and it's about volume. When cast urethane gets out close to 50 parts, um, how close are those parts to spec? And and when do you really need to start looking at injection molding tooling for the last for for things above that? Yeah, it's a it's a really good question. So that 50 part um, you know limit that I've kind of set, so to speak, is based on a couple of things. Uh, the first is just the life of the tooling for cast urethane. So um, just really hard to your point to keep a soft tool in spec for as long as you can keep a metal tool in spec. Um, another another thing to to point out here is is tight tolerances. If you have parts that 
you know, need really tight tolerances. And I would categorize that as, you know, tighter than your typical, you know, five thou or so. That's going to be something that can really only be achieved in molding. Um, and, and to your point, for consistency over time, if you're going to be making parts that are, you know, tight tolerance, really very specific in terms of their needs, um, oftentimes, even though the quantity is a good fit for cast urethane, uh, molding is going to be the, the better solution in some of those cases. Um, without a specific, you know, example or case, it's really hard for me to say uh, a, a super specific answer to that question. Um, but I would say, typically speaking, molding is going to provide uh, the much more accurate, uh, tighter to spec part. And cast urethane is typically going to be for stuff that doesn't have as tight of tolerances and, again, isn't going to be used for as long or subjected to quite as much. All right, the next question, um, when would you use aluminum tooling versus steel tooling for injection molding and what are the trade-offs? And if you want to go ahead and make a shameless plug for one of your previous webinars where we have a video, uh, go ahead. Yeah, that's a, that is probably the most efficient way to answer that question in a timely manner. Um, I did put on a, a specific webinar about aluminum tooling versus steel tooling, the similarities, the differences, the limitations of each, all that good stuff, uh, maybe about two months ago now. But either way, you can go to our website, www.eccentricmold.com, click under the resources tab, and you can see a whole list of, of past webinars that we've put on that are free to you. So you are more than welcome to go on there at your leisure, um, take a look at those pieces of content, including the aluminum versus tooling uh, piece of content, and, and really dive deeper into that. But for a really quick answer, steel tooling, uh, steel in general is a harder metal than aluminum. That means at a very base level, it's going to take much longer and much more money to create that tooling out of steel than it would aluminum. But because the material is much more hardy, steel tooling, typically speaking, is going to have a longer tool life uh, than aluminum tooling and is going to experience slower wear and tear. So that's just a very high level answer to that question. All right. And uh, looks like the last question we have here is, have you ever made injection mold components using 3D printing slash SLA and how did it go? It's a really good question. So uh, that is a newer technology that is, is really just starting to expand out there. It's not something that I've worked in personally or that Eccentric Mold offers at this time in terms of you know, 3D printing tooling. Um, we really, for, for our 23, 24 years in business now, have, have been very focused on um, the hard tooling side of things made via, via the traditional manners, and, and that's really where we've built our value and our support. So not to say that we couldn't uh, offer that in the future, just currently I'm certainly not an expert and don't want to claim to be. Right, well, that looks like all of the questions. We had one other question about uh, videos. What I'll do for everyone, uh, we will be sending out a link to the recording of this webinar within 48 hours. I'll include a link to our um, our webinar video library so that uh, you have it at your fingertips. We thank everybody for attending today and for providing uh, feedback into the polls. If you have any questions about the topic presented today, please email us at info at eccentricmold.com. Have a great day, everybody.